Recently, I've noticed that when I need inspiration to paint my minis or to work on a 40k project, I've been taking a look at the lore of the Death Watch. The stories found within not only the Codex, but also the old Death Watch RPG game are incredible world builders. They illustrate how much of the 40k universe is waiting to be explored, especially if you're coming from it from a tabletop background where you don't normally hear about the things outside of the major factions of the galaxy. My favorite parts are learning about the inner workings of the Death Watch watch stations. Some of these military fortresses are as ancient as the Imperium itself, and basically whole worlds in themselves. From vaults containing manuscripts that hold old knowledge of ancient Xeno empires and forgotten archaeotech, all the way down to space docks that house old void vessels thought to be lost by mankind during the Horus Heresy. Even the functionality of these watch stations are small glimpses as to the human ingenuity of the Dark Age of Technology. Today what I want to do is talk about one of these Death Watch Void Stations, the Watch Station Arcus. And while we go over the lore, I want you guys to think about how you could use this setting of a Watch Station to add flavor to your homebrew army, because these locations are perfect for creating custom lore. For example, deep in the vaults of a station like this could be found a lost weapon that belonged to your Space Marine chapter. It was brought there by an ancient hero that once fought for the Death Watch centuries ago. Or perhaps enslaved deep inside of a watch station is the spirit stone of a great warrior of your personal craft world. The possibilities are really endless, so even if you're not an Imperial player, you can still use these locations for army creation regardless of the race. And with that said, I want to welcome you guys back to another 40 facts about the 40k universe. I am your host Gersh1, and today we're going to be talking about Watch Station Arcus. If you guys are new to the channel, we post Warhammer 40k lore videos every single day. What I try to do in these 40 facts videos is create a lore portion in the beginning, a hobby portion in the middle, and then a Q&A at the end where I answer the comments that you guys left off in yesterday's 40 facts video, or in the previous 40 facts video. So if you guys have any questions or any suggestions, just comment down in the comment section below and I'll answer them tomorrow. But with all that said, let's get into 40 facts on Watch Station Arcus. Hidden within the turbulent gas clouds of one of Arcus System's outermost planets stands a single circular void station known as Station Arcus. Set in place thousands of Terran years before the Aculus Crusade, tens of thousands of personnel have manned Watch Station Arcus since its founding each and every one adhering to the duties given to them by their Adeptus Astarte Masters. Their command has always been the same, be ever vigilant. Appearing roughly like a pinwheel of black iron, Arcus is concealed by cunning design and arcane technology, which has allowed it to remain unnoticed for its long watch over the rimward edge of the Jericho Reach. The fortress is a vital protector of the Tuum Transitional Nexus, a region of space where three distinct stable routes within the warp intersect, making this region crucial for galactic control of the eastern fringe of the galaxy. Thousands of troops, fleets, and resources rely on this nexus for swift and reliable travel. As such, Station Arcus plays a very important role in the region. Because of its secrecy, very few agents are required to maintain the Watch Fortress. The Watch Station is only crewed by a handful of Tech Priests, a pair of mortal Death Watch Serfs, and a single Astropath. The Station is equipped with some of the most accurate and sensitive Augur Arrays the Adeptus Mechanicus can provide. It is rumored that the entire Station was constructed above Mars itself. Since its founding, Arcus has been a rallying point for numerous kill teams, but few have stayed within the station for more than a few solar hours before departing, either heading towards a vital mission or returning from one before heading back to Watch Fortress Aerioke. Each time they have departed bearing a precious crystalline data coil. It contains the Watch Station's augury logs and a transcript of the Astropath's auto senses. It is to be analyzed at length by the Lex Mechanics and the Librarian Station on Aerioke. In recent years, Watch Station Arcus has been overseen by Emil Varas, a skilled and experienced astropath. He was oath-bound to the Death Watch service for more than two solar decades. Strong-willed enough to endure the burnout that plagues many of his kind, Varas is nonetheless entirely blind and deaf, and his flesh numbed from the mind-searing effects of the soul binding, his senses deteriorating over the years as his psychic powers have increased. A quiet and proud man, Varus has a particular talent for prophecy. His psychic senses are keen even if his mortal ones are almost entirely gone. He turned his talents to gaze upon the furthest edge of the Jericho Reach. He is unsettled by the many omens that dominate his visions. Varus's visions were sadly accurate, foretelling of a great and hungry darkness beyond the rimward edge of the galaxy which has descended to cloud his sight. Defiant of the shadow and the warp, Varus has persisted in attempting to cast his psychic gaze upon the void and attempt to send a new message out to anyone that would hear it. 
Amidst this, however, has come a new complication. The last few solar months have brought increasing numbers of vessels to the Arcus system, as Imperial Navy patrols have withdrawn from the ferociousness of the Tyranid advance and regrouped in the otherwise lifeless system. The forces gathered in the Arcus system are oblivious to the Death Watch and muster for a renewed offensive against the Tyranids as soon as contact can be made with their command. Although it may seem like the small watch station can do little to stop the Tyranids' rampage in the eastern fringe of the galaxy, watch station Arcus has become a crucial hub for data collecting. Plotting the movements of the fleets and their tendrils is vital to formulating a proper defense against the Great Devourer. By warning the neighboring systems of the exact location of a Tyranid high fleet, the system can then concentrate its defenses on the very spot the tendril will enter. While this doesn't guarantee success, it does construct a blueprint for coordinating counterattacks and evacuation protocols, saving millions of Imperial citizens, but more importantly, preventing the hive ships the precious biomass they crave. Should the watch station fall, the entire sector would be completely shut off and left to guess when the Tyranids would arrive. It's also very important for the station to maintain vigil over the entirety of the system. Although the focal point of their concern is the Tyranids, the Imperial agents manning watch station Arcus must stay vigil of all the newcomers. Xeno Raiders and Corsairs could take advantage of the confusion and establish a foothold on one of the neighboring star systems or even a planet in the Arcus system itself. Or even worse, traitors or separatists fleeing from the Tyranids could be lurking within these new fleets. While the data collecting on the Great Devourer will continue, great care is being taken to collect data on all the newcomers, registering ship routes and location. The station must always be aware of the enemy from within. Found within the vaults of the watch station are relics left behind by some of the Space Marine warriors of past. They can prove useful against the Tyranid forces, such as the Omnissiah's gaze. An aspect of unmatched awareness, its machine spirit able to perceive more clearly than any device of its kind. Or the Hollowed Razor a mastercrafted power axe that was the personal weapon of champion Hadric, or the mastercrafted melted gun known as the Forge Heart, a weapon crafted by Salamander Rakem almost a Terran century ago. It's renowned for its ability to sear through steel, just as it would flesh and bone. And that's the lore to the watch station. Now, um, like I said in the beginning, listening or reading the lore of a watch station or anything that has to do with something that is a little bit outside of just like your standard huge armies going up against each other, uh, it really does inspire me to want to create some more. So let's continue working on the fortress walls. Um, if you guys remember in yesterday's 40 Facts video, the 40 Facts and Lore on the human empire known as the Azerite Stations of Uranus. Um, I was uh, trying to figure out how to paint the wall sections and make them look like concrete because the problem is that a lot of the uh, foam board that I was using it, it has a, a, a paper layer at the very top which once you like paint that it doesn't look all that great because it's just smooth uh, so one of you guys I asked you guys for help and actually I've, I've gotten a lot of comments at this point about how to or different ways to um, make a terrain piece look like it's stone or, or concrete or something like that uh, but the best one is the one that I like, I realized like, oh yeah, duh, like I should have done that. Uh, Lone Goat eight one said, for texture, a quick and easy idea is to use a thin layer of spackle, then use a large dry brush and stipple the surface. Uh, that's a great idea. That's actually what I'm gonna do now. Unfortunately, because the wall sections already have like the little um, cardstock on them. I'm not going to do it on that. I want to test this technique on the bigger like tower section. Uh, so let's let's go and do that.
and I'm actually really excited uh, with the results it's drawing right now. Um, as of recording this video, I don't know if I'm going to put like finish um, uh, images later on, uh, but I'm really excited so far. I'm going to have to go back and use this same technique that you guys gave me and put it onto um, like the other wall sections. That way everything looks kind of uh, similar. Um, so that's going to be a little challenging, but I'm going to take you guys along with me on the journey. Uh, so if you guys want to get the next part to this uh, little terrain build subscribe to the channel so you can get it it will probably come in um, the next 40 facts video which probably won't come out tomorrow it'll probably come out the next day um, just because the weekend is here uh, so I'm probably not gonna get to that uh, but thank you guys so much for for that comment um, right now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer all the comments and questions that you guys left off in yesterday's 40 facts video the 40 facts and lore on the human empire known as the Azerite if you guys have more questions for me, any more um, like ideas or, or tips for this build, um, please let me know what it is in the comment section below. You guys are awesome. You guys are giving me great um, ideas, so I really appreciate it. Let's get into some of the uh, comments. The f first one comes from Alistair Smith. Did the Emperor of Mankind ever consider the concept of a successor? Like, on one hand, if you believe his shaman origin story, then he's kind of just meant to serve as serve a purpose like the Space Marines, right? But on the other hand, if he's just a very powerful psyker with a flair of propaganda, then deep down he knows he's going to die eventually. That's actually a really good first part to it. I've never thought about that. Um, because the creation of the Emperor of Mankind was um, a bunch of shamans. I don't remember if it's a hundred or a thousand. But in the beginning of humanity, uh, these shamans sacrifice themselves to create the, uh, is it the true man, the one man, the um, well, something, well, it's basically the emperor. Um, so he must have had a purpose, and I think that purpose was to guide humanity. So he's more of like, um, um, not so much of a father figure, just because I feel like he, he, for the very first part of his life, up until the Age of Strife, the Emperor didn't um, take an active role in leading humanity. It wasn't until after the Age of Strife um, that he finally came out and said, you know what, humanity, you guys are doing it wrong, let me just take over, and then he launched his Great Crusade. If anything, I feel like uh, he would be more like the Watchers from like the Marvel Cinematics, or from comics, Marvel Comics where they're just supposed to like sit back and watch, uh, influence uh, with the difference of being uh, like the emperor would every now and then influence humanity and push it in the right direction. Um, so I never really thought about that, like how he, he had a purpose. Um, now, as far as him knowing that he was going to die, I don't think so. Um, the emperor uh, is a perpetual, so he knew that he was never going to die. Maybe that was like the last, um, or maybe that's what pushed him to finally be like, you know what, let me just take a leadership role within humanity uh, instead of just pushing them in the right direction. Um, but good concept and um, good idea. And then as far as like a successor, I guess you could say that he, he did think about uh, appointing a successor in like the field of battle. So for like his great crusade, and that successor was supposed to be... Um, Horus, uh, and that's why he became the war master, and he betrayed him, and the Horus heresy happened. Uh, so he he had like different successors for different parts of humanity, even like the 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 bureaucratic side of humanity. He left to his high lords um, because what happened was during the Great Crusade, the Emperor had control of everything, and then um, he once it started to like pushing and get and becoming successful really after the Olinor crusade which was uh, the imperium destroying the greatest um, orc empire in the entire galaxy which really they were the big threats at that time once that was done the emperor basically said okay cool i can pull back a little bit and put in your words successors into different seats within the imperium uh, in the seat of power for the Great Crusade, so to lead um, wars and stuff, is Horus. Um, to lead the bureaucratic side of uh, the Imperium, I'm going to put my High Lords, which created tension um, between these Primarchs that were like just superior to humanity in every way, and then also the, um, and now being like 
ordered what to do by these regular old humans. Um, and then even in the, because his whole thing was like, okay, so I'm going to work on the Webway project. But even the Webway project was supposed to be uh, handed off uh, later on to Magnus um, with like he was going to be manning the um, the Astronomicon and all that kind of stuff. And then he, he ended up ha uh, having to put Malkador uh, in his place and Malkador almost died. Uh, so check out our 40 facts on Malkador the Sigilite or Malkodi Malkador the Hero. Uh, so I guess... But there's a lot of uh, answers to your question, but like he, so he did try to create successors, um, but no, I, I think you're um, misinterpreting a little bit of what the emperor was. Um, he was a perpetual that knew that he was going to live forever, and his purpose was to guide humanity. If that makes sense, good question though. Next one comes from Wrath Eight One One. I think the fall of the Azerite Station would make an awesome 40k Space Marine style game. It's perfect, one with cutscenes that mention the bell before uh, things go crazy, uh, fight your way in, fight your way out, fight your way to the bomb, blow yourself up, the epilogue cutscene showing the bell tolling. Yeah, you're right. There's a lot of stories um, in 40k that I, sometimes I think like, oh damn, this would be a cool video game. This is definitely one of them. Uh, next question comes from King Josh WA1. Concrete, uh, base with a dark gray and sponge stipple lighter grays over it. You can then go back over with the gray spray paint to establish uh, an appearance of depth. I, I mean, I might try that. Uh, I really appreciate all the, of the different uh, techniques to create concrete. Um, there was another one that I read. Um, but basically, you you made me realize that the answer to my problem was in one of the videos by uh, Mel, uh, the terrain tutor. You even like call it you call it out and you say, "Well, Mel, the terrain tutor did this. Why don't you try?" Is this one it? No. Um, oh yeah, it is. Okay, so Chris Moss says, "Awesome, well done, Gersh. Thank you." Also, uh, learned something new: the homemade uh, wash. Good thinking. A little trick is to go over your board. You want to look like concrete with a mixture of PVA glue and sand. Let it dry, then give it two undercoats before doing your concrete thing. Uh, thing use a oh then use a homemade dark gray, then dry brush lightly with a very light gray. Uh, check out Terrain Tutor's channel, Gersh. Yes, Mel the Terrain Tutor is an awesome like. Um, guy and an awesome YouTube channel with a lot of really good resources, I should have gone there. Uh, and that's a cool technique. I'm going to have to try it. PVA glue and sand. Um, seems easy enough. And then uh, I got some time for more questions. Uh, this question comes from Kurt Majors. Could you explain Unbound rule set again? I want to play ad mech with Space Marine tanks and heavies. Is that possible? Yeah, you could do it. You could even do it with like... Um, just regular rules, um, or what are they called? Something Battleforged or something like that. Um, but basically, you take a penalty of minus one for allies. Uh, I don't know if it's per unit or per um, army. Um, but unbound just basically means you get to bring whatever you want. You don't have access to command points. And you also, I don't think you have access to um, something else. Um Oh, well, you are you are hurt because a lot of the synergy of some armies is going to go away. So, for example, if I'm doing, like, Orcs and Eldar, the Orc Clan uh, rule only applies to Orcs with that um, keyword. So my Eldar are not going to synergize with these Orcs unless they have something similar, which sometimes happens. Like, I feel like because Orcs, surprisingly, are shooty in 9th edition they would go really well with Skatari or with Adeptus Mechanicus because they're both really shooty. So they can synergize in that way, but not really like um, getting that plus one. No, it's a, um, is it a plus one? No, it's re-rolls on sixes and yeah, no, re-rolls on one, sixes give you additional. The Eldar or the Adeptus Mechanicus wouldn't get that. Um, but yeah, I hope that that kind of makes sense. And then the next question comes from... NPC number one, two, three. 
Is there a possibility that humanity can recover to its former glory of technological prowess and scientific thinking now that Belisarius Call has effectively begun a movement of disowning the notion that innovation is heresy? Surprisingly, it wasn't Belisarius Call, because Belisarius Call has been around for 10,000 years. Um, what, like, the quest for knowledge was hoarded by the Adeptus Mechanicus. So the Adeptus Mechanicus, in their greed, did not allow humanity to progress. So Belisarius Call is really just saying, like, no, this should be for everyone. And then all of the different, like, Adeptus Mechanicus Forge worlds are saying, like, okay, kind of, sure, we'll listen. Um, but deep down, I think they still have that, like, that... Um, that greedy mentality of like, I don't want to share my knowledge with another Forge world, let alone um, a, like a, a planetary governor or something. Um, so knowledge is power, hide it well kind of thing. Because that's, that's one of the quotes uh, that I clearly remember from Dawn of War. Um, and it's that whole mentality of like hoard your knowledge that destroyed technological prowess within the Imperium. Could we go back to it? We would have to get rid of that concept of like... I need to uh, watch out because the guy next to me might use my knowledge to hurt me, uh, which I don't see that happening in the Imperium. I feel like the Imperium is down a, on a downward, <laughs> downward spiral um, to destruction. And then um, next comment uh, comes from Alistair Smith. Um, uh, at 1730, LOL. I looked up Games Workshop, and according to Wikipedia, their net... They're net around 100 million per year, and they barely have any exposure to the much, much larger female side of the arts and crafts store or market. Um, yeah, so Games Workshop has room to grow. I don't really remember what I said at 1730, um, but yeah, for sure, uh, GW would be a really good um, company to invest in just for like their IP. Um, and also, yes, they do have a, a really strong hold on the market. Hero clicks and like whiz kids and stuff like that does not stand a chance next to the awesomeness of 40k. I mean, look at the freaking void dragon. You think we could buy this in one of those little like Dungeons and Dragons um, box thingies? No, this this is like some of the best um, mi minis that you can get. Those were the questions for today. If you guys have more questions for me, please comment down below. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I'll talk to you guys uh, tomorrow. This is Gershwin with One Mind Syndicate signing out. Oh,